open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. We will be looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, 12 through 16. Yes, I have had the privilege to work with the teens this, uh, this summer, and I've greatly enjoyed it. And uh, we have been working through the book of Philippians, and yes, I only got through two chapters, so Pastor Josh will have to finish up the last two. But I have, I have thoroughly enjoyed the study of Philippians. You know, Paul wrote the book of Philippians, and he wrote it to the people of Philippi. And really, he wrote it as a letter. And the letter was written to be used as an encouragement to the Philippians. It was supposed to be an update on Paul's life and his situation he was in. And it was to thank them for the gift that the Philippians had sent Paul while he's been in prison. We don't know which imprisonment it was for Paul, but it is believed to be written in the year AD 64. And through the first chapter and some of chapter 2, Paul expresses his care for the Philippians. And he's a genuine concern and a uh, concern for their well-being despite his own situation. Despite he was in prison at the time, and then he was also, he was dealing with accusations about himself, and he mentions that earlier in chapter 1. So right here in chapter 2, we're picking up where Paul's just finished presenting Jesus' life as an example for the Philippians to follow after. And now in this chapter, he's really encouraging them, and he's pushing them to live a life right before God, and he's explaining, explaining to them how to live it and why. So we'll re begin reading verse 12 and read down through verse 16. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Before we get started, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that I had the privilege to be here with uh, Kendall Park this summer and uh, work under Pastor Josh and Pastor Brown. And I thank you for the time here and thank you that I have this opportunity to preach tonight, Lord. And I pray you just give me wisdom and allow me just to have the words to say and just ultimately let you be honored and glorified through tonight. And thank you for everything you do for us and allow us to get home safely tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, verse 15, we see Paul tell the Philippians, among whom ye shine as light in the world. This is where we get the concept of shining as a light. And so that's why we see God wants you to shine as a light in the dark world. But before we even dive into the message more, well, why should we shine as a light? What is a light, right? So before we really dive into it, the way I think of this is, so I enjoy hunting. I love going outside. I love being in nature. You know, when you get out there watching sunrise and everything kind of wake up, it's beautiful. I love everything about it. So when I wake up in the morning, you know, it's usually by that time of year, it's cold. It's usually freezing. So I got to get on all my layers. I get on every single layer. It's a lot of layers. You know, I got to bundle up. So I get all my stuff on and I go downstairs and I get my boots on and I get my weapon and I go outside. And when you get outside, it's pitch black. You know, you want to beat the sun before it rises, beat everything before it wakes up. So it's pitch black out. It's dark. It's quiet. And so usually the ground's frozen. You know, it's below freezing. And sometimes there's snow out there. And so... You know, I start my walk to my tree stand or my spot, wherever I'm sitting. And so as you start walking, you know, it's usually, um, the ground's frozen, so it's crunchy, you know. And so you're trying to be quiet also. And you're trying to, try and be quiet, trying to get to your spot. So as you're walking, you know, you're breathing hard because you have those layers on. It's, it's freezing, it's cold, but then you're also trying to be quiet. And then in the midst of that, you're also trying to find the right path to get to the tree stand. And so all these thoughts are going through your mind, but then you're also aware of the dangers that are out in the woods, right? There's bears, there's coyotes, there's snakes, and all kinds of animals out there. So you're, these thoughts are all running through your mind. And before you know it, I, I'll get lost. It's dark, I'm in the middle of the woods. Well, if I were to just pull out a light and make a world of a difference, I could see where I'm going. I could see my next step. I know where the path I need to get on, where to go to get to the tree stand. And so what, with that thought in mind, that is kind of the sense, that is what we're living in today. That is the same world we're living in today. Jesus says in John 8, I am the light of this world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So when we get saved and we learn God's word, we become a light. We Christians, we're the light. We are lights for God. 
And then Jesus points out that we won't be walking in darkness anymore. And so that implies that people who aren't saved, they're in darkness. They're lost. They can't see. Just as I would be in the woods without a light. I'm lost. I can't see. So they're lost. They're wandering around. But we have the light. You and I have the light. And we can show them. We can show them the correct path. So that is why it's important to shine as a light. Because we have the answer. But now that we know why you need to shine as a light, and we know, and we know uh, what are lights, how can you shine as a light in this dark world? How can you shine most, effective, most effectively for God you know, as a light in this dark world? Well, by committing to Paul's exhortations. Paul gives examples. Paul explains to the Philippians here, 12 through 16, how to shine as a light. So I have three commitments we need to make tonight, you need to make tonight, in order to shine as a light. So in order to shine as a light in the, in the world, the first commitment we need to make is you, need to, you must commit to God's will. Verse 12 and 13 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So right away in the beginning of verse 12, we see Paul addresses the Philippians with a term of endearment, beloved, right? And we talked about earlier that he really cared for the Philippians and he had a concern for the well-being, despite, despite Paul being locked up in prison at that moment. So this is beloved really shows his care and his love he had for them in Philippi. And then we continue on and it says, as ye have always obeyed, not as, much, not as in my presence only, so Paul's reminding them of times they were together, you know, back when he was with them and the good times they had. And, you know, that's exciting. We can look back at memories also and remember time, and we can be excited and be encouraged. You know, I think of right here for Kendall Park when you guys, uh, when God provided the property and then he even paid it off just a couple years ago. <laughs> that's a great thing. That's an awesome, exciting thing. And God, real, that was almost a miracle in a sense. And so we can look back at that and we can be excited and we can be encouraged and that's the sense that Paul is trying to get across to the Philippians. That's, that's all Paul is doing. He's reminding them and uh, encouraging them through memories. And, but now that Paul isn't around, he says, but now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So now that Paul isn't around, he's saying you should be more obedient. Why? Because Jesus is watching you. God is watching you, and he's always watching you. So this reminds me of a story. I used to work at Amazon. And when I was at Amazon, so you have your manager, and then there's a couple other higher positions. I don't know the correct name, but I do know the guy that was up there. His name was Jeff. And so when we'd be working, and Jeff would come around, you better be doing your job right, or else Jeff would let you have it. If you're not doing your job right, or something's messy on the floor, he would give it to you. So everybody was scared of Jeff. So like when Jeff would come up on the floor, everyone was like, hey, hey, Jeff is here. Jeff is here. Make sure you're doing your job right. You know, make sure your area is clean. Make sure everything's running properly. We all knew when Jeff was around. And, and if you were doing right, he's a nice guy, nicest guy. But when you were wrong, <laughs> you didn't want to be on his bad side. He would give it to you. He was not scared. And, you know, that's the same concept. That's the same mentality we need to have. You know, when Jeff is around, or as Paul is telling Philippians, when I'm around, you know, you're doing right. But when Jeff isn't around, or when Paul isn't around per se, God's still watching. I still need to be doing right. Even though Jeff isn't there, I still need to be doing my job correctly. And that's what Paul's telling the Philippians. You still need to be living right, because someone greater is watching us. Someone greater is there with us, and that's Jesus, and that's God. And so when you're alone, and you think nobody's around, maybe you're at your house, you're in your bed, what are you thinking? What are you doing? I think specifically, what are you watching on your phone, your computer, your TV? Because whether you like it or not, you know, God is watching you. God sees your thoughts, even though you think no one else sees these thoughts, but God sees them. God knows what you're thinking. He sees what you're watching. And this is what Paul wanted the Philippians to have, that same mentality that God is watching, always. And we should live and act in a manner that God's watching. And the end of verse 12 says, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is not a good work salvation. I want to clarify that. It's not telling them it's a good work salvation. You get saved, and once you're saved, you're saved, right? You cannot lose your salvation. 
I want to make that clear. It's not a good work salvation. But once you are saved, we're constantly being molded into the image of Christ. You know, by using hard times, trials, sometimes even, even people who bring into our lives. With a fear, you know, a reverential fear of God, you know, a respect of God and his power, for what he can really do. And with trembling, you know, to shake, but with a respect of God and his power. So with fear and trembling of God, by relying on him, he will continue to help us uh, keep learning and growing. We can work to keep growing to be more like the image of Christ. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are, right? We all make mistakes. <laughs> we all fail at some point. And when you do that, when you mess up, whether it's in front of your family or whether it's in front of your coworkers, is your, or do you have that same fear of trembling? Is your first thought, oh no, what's my wife going to think? Or, oh no, what's my coworkers going to think now? You know, they have this bad view of me now. I, I failed. I messed up. But ultimately, our first thought should be, what does God think? What does God think of me right now after I made that mistake? And even better, we should be able to have that fear and respect of God. And with that, we should stop and think before we make that mistake, before we do wrong. We should stop, wait, is this going to honor God if I make this decision? Or if I say this? Or if I think this way, will this honor God? We should have that same fear and respect of God that Paul wanted the Philippians to have. So, so it doesn't matter when we, uh, it doesn't matter when we make mistakes, but we need to have that same respect and fear of God. And then verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Ultimately, yes, we are doing a work, but God is the one working you. God is the one who is working you. It's not you working you, but it's God. And it's for his good pleasure. As God works in us and he transforms our will to his will, and to will, just to clarify, is a God-given desire or aspiration toward the will of God. So he'll place the desire in us, in you, to whatever he has given you a desire to do, you know, such as owning your own business, being a construction worker, or being in full-time ministry. But those are just some of the examples. So having the desire and mindset to be used to God, he will allow you and he will enable you to complete his will for your life. You know, by serving God and following His will, it gives God good pleasure to see His children, you and I as Christians, we're His children, serving Him and striving to be more like Him in every aspect of life. So you serving God and trying to please Him, it makes God happy. It makes God God's joyful because of what you're doing. And another cool thought is God, He's going to help you and He'll give you the resources to complete His will. God isn't sitting up there. He doesn't want to see you fail he wants you to succeed. He wants you to follow his will and do what he has for you. And so when you do, it makes God joyful. And in order to do his will and please God with your life, you know what? You need to be saved first. Have you ever accepted Christ in your life? Has there ever been a moment? Can you look back in your life and see a moment where you realize you're a sinner and you recognize your need for, for a savior? And if you have done that, hey, great. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. But... It is important to seek out what God wants you to do for your life. Many times people make it a complicated subject, you know, following God's will. But if we are trying to do right and we're seeking God and we're in his word, we're praying, we're attending church and seeking what God would have us to do, he will give you a desire for something specific, just as we discussed earlier. Give you a desire for something specific. It doesn't have to be full-time ministry. Just because you're following God's will doesn't mean he's going to put you in full-time ministry. That would be great. That would be awesome. But that's not exactly what it means. So just God will give you that desire, and that's what is meant by following God's will. And the easiest way I can explain it to you guys is my own testimony. It's my own life. You know, I've told you guys my testimony before, and you know a little bit about it. In about 10th grade is when I was starting to get more serious about the things of God. And I was seeking what God would have me to do with my life. So I was in his word. I'd be praying. I'd go attend church. And I'd be asking God, what would he have me to do? And God started working me and developed a desire in my heart, in my life, to go into full-time ministry. So I followed his will. I followed what he's working in me. And so God enabled me to do his will. You know, he, he showed me where to go to college, ambassador. And so I went to college, and he provided for my first whole semester, 
I didn't have to pay a penny. That whole semester was paid off. And then, while I was there at school, he allowed me and enabled me to do well in classes, to get good grades and to pass the year. And then, and this, is, this is even cooler, I think, is I was that summer, this summer now, I was praying to God like, hey, whatever you would have me to do, I'm willing to do it. I would love to go on like a missions trip or do an internship, but God, whatever you have me do. And if not, if you don't provide anything, that's okay. That's okay with me. I'm not going out of the way though. I wasn't making calls. I wasn't texting people trying to find something to do for the summer. But out of nowhere, God, I guess, worked in Pastor Brown's heart and he called me. He sought me out to come here to serve with you guys this summer. And so God was enabling me to come here and I was able to come here and I've worked here with all of you all with all of you, and I've worked alongside Pastor Brown, Pastor Josh, and it's been a great summer. But that is God that has been working. He's been enabling me to do this and be here. And now I'm able to go back to school this upcoming semester just in a couple weeks. But my point is, is God worked in me. He gave me that desire, and then I followed his will for my life, and he's enabled me to do it. He's given me the strength to complete it. Guys, God wants you to shine as a light in this dark world. And in order to be a light, the first commitment to make is commit to following God's will for your life. Have that fear or respect of God. And if you're actively living and serving God, he will place the desire in your heart of what he wants you to do in your life. Just as I told you about my life, he gave me that desire. And that's how God works. You need to commit to follow his will so you can shine as a light in this dark world. The second commitment you need to make tonight is commit to a heart of not complaining. You must commit to a heart of not complaining. You know, in verse 14 it says, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Verse 14, the Bible says, do all things. This is a command given by Paul, not a suggestion like, hey guys, do some things, you know, do, just here and there, you know. When you're in church, you know, don't complain, right? But when you're home, you know, don't worry about it. No, this is a command. Do all things. So it's very vague in a sense. He just says things, but it literally means anything and everything. Another time Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. What Paul says here goes right along with what he's telling the Philippians. He said, do it without murmurings, you know, displeasure or complaining, and disputings, questioning. So when you're told to do something, do it with the right attitude. And don't complain or question why you have to do it. And also, a disclaimer, just because you do what you're told and you do it with a bad attitude, you're still in the wrong. It's still not right. So it's important we have a good attitude about it also. You know, it's a hard subject to handle because so Often we complain, right? Ah, I didn't sleep well last night. That pillow is getting old. Or you get a new pillow. Ah, that pillow, it's too stiff. You know, I don't really like it. Or you go out to eat. Man, that burger wasn't good. Or that, those fries are not cooked right. It's so easy to complain. We do it everywhere and all the time, right? It's so easy. And so I think of while you're at work, because this is the easiest one. Most of, your time, most of your time spent is at work. When you're at work and your boss tells you to do something, or maybe you're self-employed, right? And you have that annoying customer show up. <laughs> How many times do you catch yourself complaining or questioning why do I have to deal with this customer? Or why did the boss give me this job to do? Everybody hates this job, but I have to do it, right? It's that easy. But if you're complaining, you know, your light isn't shining. You know, others aren't going to see your light because your light is being dimmed. By that complaining, your light's going to be dim. People aren't going to see that. So you're not going to be able to help the people in the dark. So if you're murmuring and complaining, it will dim your light instead of shine. And this makes me think of the Israelites. Now, we hear lots about them. We hear lots about the times they complain. But the specific time I want to focus on is when they were in Egypt. They were in bondage for over around 430 years. They were in slavery. God used Moses and sent Moses to free his people. And Moses went unto Pharaoh, and God worked in miracles and sent plagues. And long story short, softened Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh let the people go. Freed the people of Israel. 430 years of slavery, they're finally free. 
They're finally free to go. God freed his people. And so they left. Well, as they were going, shortly after, Pharaoh got angry again, and he sent his army after him. He chased after the Israelites, and the Israelites came up against the Red Sea. They're stuck, right? Well, and, and the Egyptians were chasing after him, so they're feeling that pressure. And this is what the Israelites say in Exodus chapter 14, verse 12. The Israelites are speaking here. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They just watched God perform a great miracle. He softened Pharaoh's heart. This is over 430 years they've been in bondage and slavery, and God just freed them, and they're already complaining. They're already upset and angry at Moses and angry at God. Why didn't you leave us back in Israel, where we'd rather live there and serve and slave the Egyptians than be free? They're already doubting God. They're already complaining. We know the rest of the story. God ends up performing another great miracle, parting the Red Sea, allowing them to cross on dry, dry ground, and then end up destroying the uh, Egyptian army. And the Israelites were good. But they were complaining. And it's so easy to complain. Just a situation like that. We're not any better than the Israelites. And apparently the Philippians weren't any better than us. Because they were complaining, obviously, because Paul stated it pretty clear here, do all things without murmurings and disputings. So there's a reason why we shouldn't complain, though. You see, in verse 15, well, 14 first, it says, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that, or so that, ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as light in the world. Don't complain so that you may be blameless and harmless. You know, blameless is innocent of wrongdoing or the appearance of evil. So, and then harmless it really goes back to meaning unmixed. We're not to have lives filled with compromise. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. So it's important we even stay away from the appearance of evil or of just doing wrong because, you know, one false accusation, that could be it for us. You know, that could be it. Your life, your testimony, your job, your family, it's all over. And, you know, you might think, Oh, Dan, I'm not actually doing the sin. It just looks like it. I'm not actually committing this or saying this, but it just looks like it. Well, the Bible says, stay away from the appearance. Be blameless and harmless. An easy example to think of is the people in pro sports or celebrities. How many times do we see they get accused, and sometimes multiple accusations, and hey, they might be wrong, and they might, we might think, you know, that's what they get. They deserve that because they're not good people anyways. But that's another argument for another day. But how many times do we see them get an accusation and their lives are ruined? Their career, done. Just like that, one accusation, whether it's true or whether it's false. So it's important that we be blameless and harmless. Just abstain from even the appearance of evil. Then verse 15 continues on that, <clears throat> that the sons of God which means, you know, refers back to being the children of God, and we talked about that earlier, without rebuke, you know, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And, you know, that is exactly what we're living in today. We're in the middle of a crooked and perverse nation. You know, it's getting worse and worse every day, whether you want to accept it or not. If you look back in the Bible, the Israelites, and read about their history, that's what they lived in also. We heard about the wicked people and the evil deeds that were done. And you follow history, it's been the same ever since. And it's never gotten better. We have never seen it get better. And even right now, we want to keep looking and say, ah, you know, in the future, it'll be better. We'll be okay. We'll get through this. But in all reality, it hasn't gotten better and it's not going to get better. And that's why it's important that we shine as a light. Because it's not going to get better. So God wants you to shine as a light in this dark world. If you're complaining every time you have to do something, it's a bad testimony. And if you're so focused on complaining, you can't shine as a light because your light is being dimmed from the world if your focus is on complaining. 
It is necessary for you to commit to have a heart of not complaining so that you will be blameless, harmless, without rebuke in this dark world. First, we saw you need to commit to God's will. Second, we just saw you need to commit to have a heart of not complaining. You know what? The most important part, the shining as a light, is to commit to being a witness. Because you will be most noticed as shining as a light in this dark world by witnessing. Because when you're out witnessing, you will come across the people who are lost in the dark. And you're going to have the light. And so they will most often notice you because you will be approaching the people that are lost, that are in the dark, that can't see. And you will have the light. And that's why it's important that your light is shining. So you must commit to being a witness. And the verse 15 says, Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And 16, Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Because the world is in sin. It's been made a dark place, right? And that is why a lot of bad things are seen as dark. And that's why we see a lot of people do criminal activities, or we see criminals that are in the dark. They commit their deeds in the dark so they, don't, they stay away from the light, so they're not seen, so they're not noticed. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loveth darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Even the Bible refers to the world as a dark place. And the Bible is discussed as being a light, though. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. So that is why it's important that we hide God's word in our heart. And as we learn and continue to study the Bible, it will be in us. So when we go forth with the word in our lives and we live it out, we will stand out amongst other people because our light will be shining. And you know what? People will recognize it. People will recognize and see something different about you. They'll see you go through a trial or a situation and be like, wow, he had joy through that trial and situation. When I'd have been angry and upset and bitter, but he was able to go through it and be thankful. Or when the boss gives you that annoying job or you have to deal with that annoying customer, if you deal with it and you don't complain, you don't murmur, well, they'll recognize that. You know what? Some people will want to talk to you. Some people will come and be like, hey, what's different about you? What are you doing different? What do you have that I don't have? And that's a great opportunity. But... A lot of times, they won't come up to you, and you will be criticized for it. And, you know, you'll have that peer pressure. You'll be made fun of. It'll be even embarrassing at times. But it's important that you shine as a light. Because in verse 16 is what we really need to be focusing on. Holding forth the word of life. It literally means holding forth the gospel, right? Saying, you know, we're not just to remain faithful to God's word, but we're supposed to hold it forth. We're supposed to be taking it out, sharing it with others. This is where I see the commitment, the need that we need to commit to being a witness. Commit to sharing the gospel because that's what holding forth is. You know, when was the last time that you shared the gospel with someone? Do you even remember? When's the last time with a friend or family you shared your testimony? When God changed your life or even handed out a track? Can you remember? Have you even left one somewhere lately? Because Peter and John, when they were preaching and teaching and telling others about Christ, and they faced persecution, in that moment they were being threatened. You know what the response was? In Acts 4.20 they said, For we cannot but speak the things each we have seen and heard. You know, Peter and John, they say, no matter what, we're going to continue and preach, despite the persecution, despite you threatening us, because we can't help it. That is how much they believe and they trust in the gospel and they trusted in God. They were shining as a light. And the end of verse 16 says, That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. The day of Christ is when Christ returns for us. That will be a great, great day. And in that day, Paul is saying he hopes he can see their fruits and he can rejoice because of what God has done in and through the Philippians. So Paul is referencing then running the race for the prize. And he did this in other passages, such as Corinthians, Galatians, and Timothy. And Paul compares running a race to the Christian life. Because as in it, it will be hard, it will be long, and we're going to face challenges. You know what? Some days you're going to wake up 
and you're not going to want to do it. You're not going to want to go out and live in a sense, right? There's going to be those bad days because it's hard. But it's important we run the race because there's a prize. There's a prize that we can look forward to. If you're running a race or in the Christian life, and that prize is Christ. That prize is Jesus in heaven. We'll be with him one day. So then Paul tells the Philippians, when I get to heaven, I can rejoice for all you did so that I didn't labor in vain or empty. Simply, my work wasn't useless or a waste of time. And you know what? Just so it makes it clearer for you guys, that would be the same as Pastor Brown or Pastor Josh, or even I right now, saying, hey, live this way so that our work, our time that we invested in you wasn't useless. That's what Paul's telling the Philippians. Hey, live this way, commit to doing this and shining as a light so that my time wasn't useless or wasn't in vain. God wants you to shine as a light in this dark world. And one of the ways we can do that is by committing to sharing the gospel, holding forth God's word. We need to make it a personal priority, even as Peter and as John and Paul made it. Tell people and and really, really focus on it. Because you won't be able to do that, though, unless you commit to the previous two steps. You must commit to God's will and commit to having a heart of not complaining. Because if you haven't committed to those previous two steps, there's no way that you'll be out sharing the gospel. There's no way you'll be out shining because your light will be dimmed and won't be noticed. So overall tonight, we saw three commitments to make. is shine as a light in this dark world. Just as I mentioned earlier, in order to commit to following God's will, you need to be saved and recognize your need of salvation. And you know what? If any of you in here haven't done that yet, and you, you know deep down inside you that you have not made that choice, you need to realize and recognize your need of a Savior. And I would ask you tonight, if you haven't, don't leave tonight without, without doing it. It's the best thing that you could possibly do. And Pastor Brown, Pastor Josh, or even I would be happy to talk to you tonight after the service. But if you have, if you are saved, you know, to shine as a light, you need to commit to God's will in your life. You can do that by following Him and serving Him. He'll place that desire in your heart as we discussed. You know, second, in order to shine as a light, you need to commit to have a heart of not complaining in all scenarios of life, right? And lastly, in order to shine as a light, we need to make witnessing, you know, commit to make witnessing a real priority. You know, start small. Start by even handing out one track a week. But start somewhere. You know, Paul heavily encouraged the Philippians in these matters because he cared and he loved them. Paul wanted them to shine. Paul wanted them to live for God so that others that are lost in the dark, and they're everywhere, will see the light. You know, my my question for you guys tonight, are you going to make these three commitments in your own heart, in your own life this week? And if you are, if you are going to follow these three commitments, are you going to go out and are you going to live them out in the following weeks? Are you going to commit to God's will and you're going to go live and follow God's will? Are you going to go out and commit to a heart of not complaining and really focus on not complaining? And then are you going to commit to being witness? Are you going to look for those opportunities this week? Because it's one thing just to make the commitment and then say, all right, that was a good message. Good job, Dan, you know, and then just go home, you know. Okay, good job. That was a good time. But what's the point if you're not actually going to live them out? So I challenge you, if you have made these commitments, Go out in the weeks this week and the weeks to follow and live it out. I want to encourage you all to make these commitments in your own heart and life once again so that God may use you to shine as a light in this dark world this week and the weeks to follow. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity I had to be here and uh, preach your word, Lord. I pray that you are lifted up and you are glorified through tonight's message and that we make these three commitments in our own heart and our own lives this week, Lord. I pray that you just help us to live for you and continue to serving you in whatever we do. And uh, give us all a good night tonight and get us home safely. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I go, though, um, I would like to thank everybody for the summer. And I would like to thank Pastor Brown, Pastor Josh specifically, for really helping me and uh, working with me and taking time and investing in me and just teaching me and allow, help me to read books and study and uh, learn how to write sermons and all that great stuff. I've been truly blessed by all of you. And I'm very, very thankful for the meals you provided and uh, the times we've had out going for dinner, some of you, and uh, just really investing in my life. 
I'm very thankful for all of you, and I will truly miss you all. Um, it would be really hard to leave, and uh, I'm not looking forward to it at all. I will be back. I will try to come back uh, during uh, breaks, I think fall break or Thanksgiving here. And my goal is to get back here. And uh, once again, I just thank you all for everything you've done. Uh, I love you all, and uh, have a good night. <laughs>